Yes, I'm standing by with the mayor of Cape Town, Jordan Hill Lewis, uh, joining us on what is now a very sunny uh, Cape Town day. Jordan, there's so much to talk about, but I want to start here because there's a lot of discussion about a post-election scenario, what a coalition could potentially look like with maybe the DA, maybe the ANC. I mean, what are the discussions amongst the party members about what, how governing could potentially work? <laughs> I suspected you might go straight there. Good morning to you. <laughs> on this magnificent Cape Town uh, morning. Today is, of course, the first day of the election, really. Special votes uh, open in about uh, 20 minutes or so. And at the moment, for the next 72 hours, the focus is 100% on turning out as many of our party supporters as is possible to get out and make sure that when this new government is negotiated, as we believe it will be, that we have the strongest possible negotiating position with the, with the most uh, chips at the table. It really is almost impossible to predict exactly how these, these uh, new government negotiations are going to turn out. If the ANC does uh, as consensus seems to expect that they will do in the mid to high 40s, that will still be a momentous moment for South Africa because they will have lost their majority for the first time in 30 years. But it will be quite easy for them to put together a, a coalition of the bits and pieces parties, we call them, all the small, tiny 1% and, and below parties. Really, where it gets fascinating is if they, uh, if they underperform to expectations and, and get in the low 40s, mm. then, uh, then we really, th there's only a, a few options on the table. It is the Democratic Alliance, the party I represent, which is a, part, a centrist party. Uh, it is the, uh, the Economic Freedom Fighters, which is right. the uh, far left party, and the party of our former president, Jacob Zuma, called MKP. Right. Those are the only options on the table. Mm. And there, I will say what I've said publicly before, and really uh, not more than that, I think it would be a devastating uh, uh, development for South Africa to have a far left left government uh, of, of the EFF and that we should be uh, we should do quite a lot to to prevent that from happening. Well, and we're, we're also hearing concerns among investors on that yeah. front. When we talk about the, the Western Cape in particular, mm. uh, it is obviously one of the major provinces that voters are going to be paying attention to, investors are paying yes. close attention to, and it's really touted as a stable part of the country. I, I mean, do you think the stability that you've been able to cultivate here is going to be enough to, to turn out voters on a national level? I, I do think so. I think all the, the three biggest provinces in South Africa are this one where we're in, right. the Western Cape, uh, one on the on the coastal east called KwaZulu Natal, and then the central heartland called Gauteng. Those three uh, make up well over 50, nearly 60 percent of the national voters' roll, and all three of them are hotly contested. None of them will have a majority ANC government, and that means voters in those three provinces are very motivated. If you go and speak to folks on the streets of Cape Town, they are fired up to make sure that this province stays uh, DA. Hmm. If you go and speak to uh, voters on the streets of Joburg in Gauteng, they are fired up to go and vote and make sure that there is change in that province as well. So for that reason, I think that we are going to have a very good turnout in those three provinces. Because they make up 60% of the national voters' role, I think that's going to drag the entire national turnout up in this election. Well, and also the DA has been very successful in terms of political fundraising uh, because yes. we know a majority of asset managers are down here. Is that really where you, you see the, the majority of, of voters coming from? Uh, certainly not from asset managers. No, no, no definitely not. Uh, perhaps the, the the majority of of, of Bloomberg uh, 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 viewers, but certainly not voters. No, the, the the vast majority of voters in this city and this province are ordinary middle class and working class people, and many many unemployed people. Uh, but it is true that the business community uh, have seen the benefit of stable. Uh, uh, pro-business, investment-oriented government here in in the Western Cape, and so they have uh, they do support that, and and you know we're very grateful for that. And of course, that gets you into a virtuous cycle in which you, the the state here, our government has more resources in which we can spend on the poor, out there in the in the Cape Flats that we can see from this this rooftop. Right. We want to uh, spend as much as possible investing in better 
better livelihoods for the uh, poorer communities. And for that to happen, you have to have investment, you have to have uh, support from the business community to drive up revenues. It, it, how does Amazon then play into that? Because Amazon is making this yes. their Africa headquarters. It's extraordinary. The, the, it used to be the case that uh, the city of Cape Town was the, biz, uh, the biggest employer in, in this city. Mm -hmm. After that, an asset manager called Old Mutual, who I'm sure you're familiar with. It's now the case that Amazon has overtaken Old Mutual as the second biggest employer in this entire city. Mm. More How than 9,000 people yeah. uh, here employed by, by that giant. Uh, and we, we, you know, we have, that's wonderful, an endorsement of, of the in investability, the bankability of our city and, and our province. So we're thrilled with that. And that is being replicated. Of course, there aren't that many global giants of Amazon size, but it's being replicated at a smaller scale by dozens, hundreds of other firms who are relocating here uh, because of the stability, because things work, because infrastructure investment's happening. How does that then translate into more jobs? Because we know unemployment yeah. is an issue for this country. It's it's the the issue. Yeah, thirty three percent. Thirty three percent on the on what we call the standard definition, on the expanded definition, which includes those discouraged job seekers. It's it's forty percent and above. So it is a massive, massive issue. Here, of course, it's fifteen percentage points lower. Uh, it's still too high. I think by global standards, uh, twenty one percent unemployment, which is what we have here in Cape Town, would still be considered a crisis. But it is tracking in the right direction. In the last two years, three hundred and sixty thousand. Uh, new jobs in the city alone, more than all of the seven other big cities in the country combined. And the way that we are doing that is by investing in basic infrastructure that attracts businesses here. Of course, we have uh, things which we can't take responsibility for, chief, chief among them the, the magnificent tourism sites around us this morning. Uh, but the tourism industry has boomed. Uh, uh, places like this, establishments like this are growing and creating new jobs. And businesses from, from up country are coming down here because they want a place that works or they want a place with reliable infrastructure. Well, and I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because reliable is a lot of the question around energy, yes. right, when we talk about South Africa. And you've been somewhat successful, I think, here in Cape Town, uh, weaning off of the national grid itself. Yes. I mean, does that continue to make progress in terms of uh, taking Cape Town away from ESCOM? I mean, what, what is the plan there and how, how do you then expand that nationally? Is, is that what should be, you know, the DA should be focused on? So South Africa has this uh, phenomenon of load shedding. I'm sure uh, informed uh, viewers are, are aware of it. It's a euphemistic term for power cuts. The national entity, the national utility rather, ESCOM, is unable to provide the power that we need at peak times. In the city, just in our city, that accounts for about 400 megawatts of shortfall at peak times. So we have said we, we cannot wean ourselves entirely off the national grid, but we can make up that gap, that 400 megawatt gap at peak times that allows us to stop load shedding, to stop power cuts here in the city at least. And that is a huge attract, attraction point for businesses. So we're, we're roughly halfway through that. We can protect our city from two stages of load shedding. And I won't get into the technicalities of how the stages work, but just think about roughly four hours of, of, of power cuts per Per day, we can protect our city from with green energy, with 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 renewable energy, with our own energy investments, overwhelmingly solar, but some other sources as well. <laughs> the first city in the country, and possibly uh, in the continent, so far as I'm aware, that is actually paying people for the power that they sell back to us from their from their rooftop grids, paying them in in, in cash uh, every month. So all of those investments are adding up over time, where we can m make up that utility shortfall.